Hey everybody, we've got a lot to get through today. Let's not waste a whole bunch of time talking. Let's get right to it. So we've got the first of the tri-build blocks cleaned up, ready for reassembly. All that honing grit is gone. Here's the crankshaft I'm going to use. It has a fresh 20 thousandths undersized grind on the rods and on the mains. All that's been miked and verified. Here's the new bearings. Again, 20 thousandths undersized on each. Here's front main bearing, 4F9413. Here is rear main bearing, 4F9416. Again, both of those have been verified and they have been checked against the clearance specs for that crankshaft. We also have two of the new 2A3435 retaining dowels that stake those bearings in. Very important to put a new one of those in each time. Here are the main seals. We have front main seal, rear main seal. The old cat number for the front main was the 2B6005. I crossed it to the 29951. Specifications right there. Rear main number 1B2245 goes to the 17484. Again, specs right there. And then over here, the rest of the pieces we're going to use today. Of course, we have the crankshaft sprocket, the woodruff keys for that. Cat calls this a washer. It's the sealing surface for that front main seal. Then we have the heavy washer, the full overlock, and the two bolts that secure that sprocket to the crankshaft. And then the rear cover with the bolts that hold that on. And remember now, this is going to be the easiest crank install of the three blocks we have here because this one is in the best shape. We have a good bearing bore. We've got a good dowel hole. It's never been hogged out. We've got a good web that's not cracked right there. As we go down the line, that one's a little bit worse. That one's worse still. So if you want like the right, correct, and proper book spec the way it was back in the day install procedure, this is going to be the one. I'll start with the rear main bearing because it's the most straightforward. I've got to press it into the cover and the only critical part is to make sure the oil holes in the bearing line up with those oil holes in the cover. I want to show you real quick as I'm pressing this in, one thing I like to do is use a square and a sharpie marker to put a couple lines down the outside of that bearing that are centered up with all the holes. And I draw some corresponding lines on the inside and just give myself a couple little marks on the top edge so you just line everything up and usually everything drifts together just the way you want it. Okay, out of the press and into the vise for this next step. And just to assess real quick, when you get those oil holes lined in, if I shield the light, you can see all three are lined in just perfectly. The bearing usually ends up flushing out with the back of that flange anyhow. So the next step now is to drill the hole in the bearing that's going to accept that retaining dowel. And it's very important to follow this step to the letter. We'll go straight to the manual. It says using the hole in the block or flange as a guide, drill through the bearing with a 1560 force drill. Then finish ream the dowel hole to 0.249 to 250. In other words, straight quarter inch, true quarter inch, or maybe slightly, slightly under. If you go straight to a quarter inch drill bit, that's going to leave you with too large of a hole. That dowel is not going to be a tight enough fit. It will work out. So I've got the 1564 loaded in the old 3 8 drill because this is the only one with a chuck that's small enough to allow me to drill down and clear the upper part of that, uh, that cover flange there. So. Drill's a little bit rough, I know. It's been through a lot. All right, that'll be good. Final step now, drive in the dowel, and I'm using some sleeve retaining Loctite on it just to give it a little bit more help. Nice tight fit, I'm liking it. There, it's all the way in. That's a good fit, really happy with that. So we're done with the easy one. Really the only things we had to be mindful of were the alignment of those oil holes and the installation of the dowel. So this rear main really has a pretty easy life. It's gonna end up wherever it ends up on this rear journal and it has to support that heavy flywheel. Aside from that, it really doesn't have to do much. This front main bearing, however, is half the size and it copes with a ton more adversity. 
all of the in thrust of the crankshaft works through this bearing. So this is basically a thrust bearing as well. It goes on this back journal and the radius at the base of this web is the one thrust face and the other one is actually on the inside of that seal washer that goes on like that and is underneath the press fit of the gear. So what you need to do before you press this in the block is measure what the end play is going to be because many times these replacement bearings are actually made a little bit deeper than the originals. And they do that to take up for, you know, if you had a crank ground undersize like this one, if that radius was rough or pitted or whatever, they're gonna grind into that a little bit and clean that up as well. So that basically makes your journal deeper. So in order to control in play and set in play, the replacement bearings are made deeper as well. So you don't wanna press this into the block right off the bat only to find that you might have to take it back out and put it in a lathe and take some material off and by then you've probably drilled the dowel hole and you're going to wreck it pressing it out and you're going to have to go buy a new one. So getting that end play checked first is key. Now you've got three ways to perform this initial end play check to determine if you need to remove any material from the bearing. We've got the hard way, we've got the somewhat easier way, and we've got the squatch way. So the hard way would be to measure the depth of the bearing and then set up some tools to accurately measure the depth of the journal from the shoulder to that radius, do your math. The not quite so hard way would be to just slide the bearing onto the journal. And so we've got this chamfered inside edge here. We have the square inside edge there, put the chamfered edge in because of the radius. And then take the gear. You can forget about the seal washer for this because we just need to know how much distance we have between this shouldered edge and the end of the bearing. So this is a perfect stand in, but it's a press fit. So you'd have to press it on and then see if your bearing is bound. Hopefully it's not bound. If you can press it on and there's still a little bit of play there, take your feeler gauge after the gear is seated up to that shoulder and determine what the end play is gonna be. And then you have to pull the gear back off. You can take this off, make any adjustments that might be necessary. Or you can do it the squatch way. Put the bearing on there, put your press fit gear back here Take another gear that's not in quite as good condition and take about two thousandths out of the inside of that so that it is now a slip fit, not a press fit. See how much easier that is? And with the heavy washer and both of the bolts just finger tight, that holds that gear securely onto the crankshaft. We have our play, we can do the measurement with the feeler gauge and we have 13 thousandths of an inch in play. We'll reference that to the manual starting engine crankshaft End clearance, 10 to 15 thousandths. Maximum permissible end clearance, 25. That's quite generous, but we're at 13. I'd like it to be 10, but there's not a lot we can do about it at this point, even with our deeper bearing. Well, the good news is we don't have to do any machining. I was kind of hoping we'd have to take a few thousandths off. I could at least demonstrate it, but that's not in the cards at this point. And yeah, the guy that did the grinding on the crank also told me that he did have to refresh that radius right there. It was a bit rough. So that made our journal a bit deeper. We're still running in spec. So yeah, we go with it. And I know somebody's going to ask, do I feel bad about sacrificing a gear? No, I don't because I've got a lot more of these gears than I have good crankshafts for them to go on. So this is a tool now. It's going to go in the box with the rest of the special cat tools and it's very handy. It serves a very good purpose now. To press the bearing into the block now, I'm just using the same hollow ram setup that I used to pull the old one out. Now, when I press these front main bearings in, I like to center the bearing in the bore so that a little bit of it is sticking out on each side. So we have a little bit standing out proud there and same for the inside too. It's kind of dark in there, but with the light, I think you can see it's about as much sticking out on the inside as the outside. Granted, the manual states to press them flush with the inside of the bore. I just like to have it out a little bit. It's just more insurance that it keeps these rotating webs and everything off of sidewalls. So we also have oil holes lined in. We're ready to dowel it. But first, before we dowel that front main and make it permanent, I just want to test spin the crankshaft in here without oil seals, without connecting rods, without anything. And I've lightly oiled all the bearing surfaces so we don't have to worry about scarring anything. This rear cover self aligns. So, yep, we're good. No binding, no tight spots. 
Perfect. Just wanted to verify that. All right, now we can make that permanent. Same routine as last time. First we drill. Then we ream. And then we double. Moving on, I put both of the main seals in and we're all assembly lubed up so we can set the crankshaft home for good. This is where I just don't want to ding anything. Not at this point, right? All right. Sealing washer goes on now. We just carefully work it into the seal. The gear goes on next, so I've stuck both of the woodruff keys in with some grease, so we need to align that C that's stamped on the crankshaft with this C that's stamped on the gear. Very important to get those lined up. And the way I prefer to press the gear on is with the heavy washer that holds it on anyhow, and two longer fine thread 3 8 bolts with some pusher nuts. It's a bit time consuming, but it pushes the gear on. The only trouble I have with this setup is it gives me enough time to think about how I could be using the hollow ram for this. And after I seat the gear, I take the installer bolts out, I put the cat bolts in, secure them with the fold over lock. And well, yeah, we're done with the majority of the crankshaft installations. So, the next step would be to put this rear cover on. The trouble is, to put anything else in there, it really helps having this rear cover off because you can gain some access through there. So we're at a crossroads right now. It's, well, looking at the files on the camera, I am at the desired you know, limit for an episode. If I go much longer than where we are right now, my blazing rural internet loses its mind, okay? It's, it's really gonna be difficult to get a, an episode done, but should we just turn this the rest of the way into a short block? Uh, everything's already been gone through and it's ready to go. Um, hey, it, it, it doesn't pay to argue. We're turning this into a short block. You're just gonna have to sit through more assembly. Um, I'm gonna have to do it fast though. Okay, off camera, I hung the rods to the pistons. I also have the bearings loaded and all the rings. Everything has been clearance checked and verified as good. Where did I get the rods? Well, I ended up having the machine shop do three complete sets of connecting rods here. The other two, they checked them for straight, rounded the big ends, made sure all that was good, and then I had NOS bushings and wrist pins. They sized all of that appropriately. We loaded those into those new old stock pistons. I'm not gonna talk about checking ring gap and all that stuff. You watched me do that when I fitted the pistons to the diesel engine on the D3400 there. So it's all just the basic deal, kick it in sideways and then kind of flatten it out, take the crown of the piston, slide it in the bore, square it up, use a feeler gauge to check the gap. Well, we go to the specs here, piston rings, compression ring gap, 12 to 22, oil ring gap, 12 to 20. I'm gonna tell you guys the truth, even using brand new cat rings, I've never seen anything but 25 to 30 thousandths gap in there. It's not going to matter on these things. They're just happy to be getting new rings. So the compression ring is a 6B2848 standard size, two required per piston. The oil control is a 2A3660, again, standard size, two required per piston. We have the 20 under rod bearings, which are the 3B7938, one unit required per rod. One thing that was perfectly to spec with these piston rings was the side clearance in the grooves. Again, reference the manual, compression ring groove clearance one and a half to three thousandths, oil ring groove clearance one to two and a half. They were both on the tight end of the spec, both pistons with new old stocks and brand new stuff. Pretty much to be expected, you're just verifying that all this stuff is correct and proper. I also did the clearance check on 
the rod bearings to the journals. Now, using the plastic gauge method once the crankshaft is installed is very, very difficult. It's really tight working in here. So I definitely recommend using the inside bore gauge inside the bearing. It puts a few little marks in there. It's not the end of the world, but if you do want to try the plastic gauge route, you can do it before the crankshaft is installed. A little while ago, I did it, in fact, on the bench here just to prove it can be done. It can be done right there. Just gotta keep that rod from spinning. So first piston ready to go in, wrapped up in the ring compressor and we got the assembly lube and the oil where they both need to be. Of course, we're starting with the one that's on the inside. Starting this bottom castle nut, you can see why it's handy to have this cover area open. And now we torque to 14 foot-pounds. There we go. And of course, small torque wrenches are also your friend working in here. So to make this permanent, I need to put the cutter pins in both of those castle nuts. And I think you can see the one on the bottom is lined in perfectly with the slot right now, as is the one on the top. And that's no accident. So you know how I hoard parts, right? I've got plenty of these castle nuts for the connecting rods. I I don't throw any of this stuff away because I'll actually go and pre-torque these caps with the rod in the vise just to see how those slots are going to line in because it's so much easier getting all that stuff pre-fit before it's in this tiny little crankcase. You know, if something doesn't completely line in like perfectly, like the cotter pin hole is behind one of the, the flats, you know, I'll just swap that out, grab another one, torque it down, and eventually you'll find one that's going to line in, if not perfectly, really really close so that 14 foot pounds torque spec the manual says it is permissible to advance it one additional slot in the castle nut in order to line in that cotter pin i prefer just to try and keep them as close to the 14 foot pounds as possible i don't know how many times these rod bolts have been torqued possibly stretched i don't want to keep just turning down on those things so that's my strategy for trying not to overstress those old bolts now piston number two same deal Moving on, everything in the crankcase is finalized. We've got the rods torqued, cotter pins are all in. I can finally install this rear cover. I do have some sealer backing it up, and that's my homemade gasket. You all know by now I make all my paper gaskets, but one thing I want to note, I do like a 50 to 60 thousandths thick gasket in this area. If you put a thinner gasket than that in there, this face can drift awfully close to that crank web. It can reduce your end play, or bind the crank. Is that an Easter egg? I prefer not to say. Another thing I should point out, I back up the threads of these bolts for this rear cover with some sealer because you can see we've got open threaded holes all around. In fact, only the bottom two are actually blind holes. So we seal those threads just to uh, prevent any oil seeps. We've still got our backlash, so that's good. Let's give everything a spin. Just have a look at it. You can really hear the drag of those new rings. But it all looks good. Rotating assembly is finished. 
I'll put the camshaft in now. And you remember that C stamp that was on the crankshaft gear? The cam gear also has a C stamp in it. Line those two marks up. And to round out the short block, tappets and valves. And now to check our work, I always like to do this. I've got the cylinder set up on valve overlap. You can see both of them are rocking there. So we have intake stroke. So the intake valve is open. The piston is drawing in air. Now we're compressing it. And then boom, here's power stroke. We just ignited it. And now exhaust valve is opening as the piston's coming back up. We're pushing the exhaust out. And we start the process over. Intake. Compression, power, and exhaust. Perfect. Wrapping it up because we're in overtime now. The first short block of the tri build is complete. The only downside, this was the easy one. We've been coasting on autopilot to this point. This one's next. And with it comes this problem right here. All right, a new bearing's not going to stay tight in there. We can't use a dowel to retain it anymore. And I've got four other blocks here that are just as bad. So what I wanted to do initially, well, there's one part of me that just says, throw that thing in the milling machine, true out that bar, custom turn a new bearing, and you're on to the next one. Let's keep the feed going. Another part of me says, that's such a common failure. The most efficient way to do it in the long run, looking at the bigger picture, is to devise some sort of a line boring apparatus that I can just switch from block to block to block as I find them and repair them and I've already got a solution already made. I think you know where I'm going with this. So it's gonna mean that the next episode here might be a long time coming because I have quite a trial and error thought process and design and build and everything that I'm gonna to have to do to see if I can make something work. Then again, we can always use some of that as content too. So I'm gonna start rolling ahead on that next part of the job and well, I gotta let y'all go. My internet's already yelling at me. Hope to see you back again, everybody.